I want to encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word today. If you're new with us, this is what we do. Uh, we honor the Lord as we come to his word. We actually think the word of the, of the Lord is, is a big deal, the center of the gathering of God's people. And so we come to hear it and we gladly sit under it, but we stand in respect and awe of the one who gives it. Name of the Lord. This is uh, Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. I'm going to read down to verse 10 of chapter 2. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of, the fi- uh, of, the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet, yet, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You can be seated. Well, good morning, church. Such a good day to be together. Such a good day to be mindful of the fact that we as Christians are part of the people of God, the people of Christ strewn all across the world. Amen? And we can live so easily in this kind of tunnel vision of my life and Christianity this way. And this is such a blessing when we can come alongside our brothers and sisters and pray for them and try to even for a second put ourselves in their shoes, right? It was just for, I think, many of us a terrifying reality, but one we do well to do. And I'm glad we got to do that today. My name's Scott. I am the lead pastor here at Doxa Church. And it seems like losing your voice is, is a thing. I wasn't yelling at kids like Pastor Chris, who probably needs some counseling himself as he's running our biblical... I'm just kidding. But, uh, but I've just been talking a lot this week. Go figure. Um, and so it is what it is. I trust the Lord is going to sustain it. Um, looking forward to meeting you if you're new. I would love to get the opportunity to hang out with you. I'm going to hang out by the windows after the services. Come say hi if that's not your thing. I totally get it, but I want to be there if you want to connect. Um, we're going to be in the book of Jonah this morning. So Jonah chapter one, we're really finishing chapter one, going into chapter two. And this is our back two series. This is our, you guys are going back to like rhythms and life. Your kids are going back to school. Well, the church is going back to remembering its mission. We're going back to remembering that we have a call, and it's to be a people of God that gathers here in one body, but as the responsibility to glorify him by making disciples both here and of all nations. God, help us to be faithful to that. And so we're back to our mission, being mission-minded as believers, seeing your lives wherever you are, however you work, um, whatever context that's in, and the people that surround you, that is your mission field. And, and maybe even beyond that, what would the Lord have you do beyond that is yet to be seen. 
but we're going back to the mission. We're going back to a book of the Bible. And so we find ourselves in Jonah and our series title is sent because Jonah was sent by God. He was sent to a nation. He wasn't wild about. And in the midst of it, we learn a whole ton about God's mercy. And so we're going to continue to dive into that today. And so the title of the message this morning is salvation belongs to the Lord. And y'all remember where we left Jonah, correct? He's drowning in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. That's where he is, right? And he's drowning in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So if you're jumping in today, we have a prophet who was tossed off a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, really actually happened, and he is swimming for, I don't know, until cramps until he can't swim anymore, until the muscles in his body give out, and then, and then he's going to drown. That's, that's where he is. You know, I know you probably see that on a flannel graph. They didn't show the drowning part, right? But that's where he is, and really what this is is the culmination of this kind of downward path of spiritual desertion that he's been on. The really cool word that we're using these days is spiritual deconstruction. Maybe you're walking through some of that. Maybe, maybe coming to Doxa is your version. I'm spiritually deconstructing by exposing myself to a broader version of Christianity than I knew before, or whatever it is. And for Jonah, he was spiritually deconstructing. He had been walking this path, and it started with two main realities. He had departed from the Word of God, no longer saw it as the authority over his life. You can be sure when someone is on a path towards spiritual desertion, they're going to depart from the word of God. When you depart from the word of God, you lose your spiritual compass. Pride kicks in and you think you have your own compass internally. You lose the one that the word of God provides. But that's not the only thing that happened. He defied God's presence. So departure from God's word, spiritual compass goes out. Defying God's presence, spiritual commitment to the Lord goes out. Spiritual compass gone, spiritual commitment gone, spiritual submission to the purposes of God. That's where he was on this path down towards, and you can follow it in the text because each word, I don't know if you've seen this, each time the word down is used, it's an indicator of something. So he went down to Joppa to catch the ship in verse 3. He went down into the ship later in verse 3. He went down into the inner part of the ship to take a spiritually senseless nap in verse 5, correct? And today, he's going to go down to what we would probably understand as rock bottom. I mean, this is a down that nobody wants to experience. Look at verse 6. I went down. Now, now we're used to Disneyland. This is a different land whose, whose land... Who's the, to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. That's like the nether world. That's like going down to your death. This is Jonah's rock bottom. But what I find so encouraging about this passage is that it's the place at rock bottom where so many of us get, where God's mercy intersects our lives. And there's one thing to know about mercy. Jonah knew the answers. Jonah knew theology. Jonah could tell you about the general things of God. He even had much memorized of the Old Testament, which we're going to see. But would you agree there's a difference between saying, I understand the concept of mercy, and I have experienced God's mercy. God's going to lead Jonah to an experience of God's mercy. God's going to bring Jonah to an end of himself, to the rockiest of rock bottoms, only to, for the first time, maybe, truly, for Jonah understand just how merciful God is. I was telling you last week about a guy named William Cooper who wrote this incredible poem that reshaped for me as a Christian what God does. When God purchases us out of our sin and brings us into the kingdom of his beloved son through the person and work of Jesus Christ by faith as a free gift, when he does that, every storm in the Christian's life is a storm that will break in mercy to you, right? Now, what you don't know about William Cooper, though, is that he's got a story, like many of you have a story, like Jonah had a story of hitting a rock bottom himself. 
While we esteem him for being this guy who's written several of the most famous hymns in the Christian church, uh, many of us don't know that the place he hit rock bottom was in the middle of St. Albans' insane asylum in the 1700s. He was so burdened and depressed that he, he have you ever heard someone talk about it where um, they just literally believe they've done so many bad things. I don't care what you say about God's forgiveness. He can't forgive me. Like you shut the door so firmly believing that God, you, you, there's no way. The cross is not enough. Nothing is enough. He had this burden that he believed he was carrying that he could never be forgiven. And it landed him in an insane asylum where he was so severely depressed he wanted to kill himself. And mercy dawned in the insane asylum through a Christian doctor who opened to him John chapter 11. And he saw the mercy of God through Jesus to Lazarus. And he broke down weeping. And he said in that moment, he said, my heart came alive and softened to God. He got out of the insane asylum and he moved to Huntingdon, which is a town in England, where he would meet John Newton. John Newton is the writer of Amazing Grace, who himself had a story of rock bottoms like Jonah. He himself, a seafaring slave trader, who met the Lord through a storm literally on the sea as well when his life was at risk and there were people fending for the ship's survival through a wicked storm. He was sent, sent to go up to the pumps to pump water out of the ship, which by the way, the guy before him that was there died doing it. And he is pumping desperately to try to survive out in the middle of a storm like Jonah had been in and God's mercy dawned on him. And here is his take. He said, I, for the first time, stood in need of an almighty savior. I heartily renounced my former profaneness and was severely touched with the sense of the undeserved mercy. Being brought forth through so many dangers, I was sorry for my misspent life and purposed in immediate reformation. John Newton would go on to meet Jesus, who would go on to be the counselor of William Cooper for the next 13 years, all because of the stories of God's mercy in the midst of our rockiest of bottoms. Listen, what I'm telling you is I don't know what your story is, but I know if you're, especially if you're a Christian, you have a story where the Lord met you in his mercy. Maybe you are, your story hasn't come yet. Maybe your story is in part seeing God's mercy today. But what I can assure you of is this. Salvation belongs to the Lord, but he's inclining Jonah towards something. He leads us to mercy for the purpose of something, and I want to share that with you today. Okay? He leads you. God is trying to extend his mercy to you so that something will happen. Yes, to magnify the Lord, but he hasn't left us here merely to magnify him. And here's the big idea. This is the point of this passage in the greater scheme of the book of Jonah, okay? That God saves. He saves. Salvation belongs to the Lord by means of mercy, listen, to make us merciful. This is the lesson Jonah is going to learn today. God saves by means of mercy to make us merciful. Jonah needed this. Here's the reality. If you are not a Christian, you need this. Not that in the making, that not that in the becoming merciful, you somehow make yourself right with God. No, you become merciful because you know you're right with God, not by your efforts, but by God's mercy. And some of us Christians, we can get so entitled because of our maturity and our growth and our what we give to God that we can lose sight of the mercy that saved us in the first place. And so what God does often is he provides wake-up calls. You're becoming insensitive to his mercy. You need to wake up again. You, solid Christian, 
who sees yourself so highly, you need to be brought down again to see that God picked you out of the pit and he does it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. God never stops pulling us out of pits and revealing mercy to us. And so I got to have you see this today. I want to be this. I want to be merciful. You know how it is like in ministry and life? It's like you can get jaded so easily. Wouldn't it be better if you just became merciful? I want this so bad. I want this for us. I don't want to take the way people have treated me or the things that have been done and carry those as chips on my shoulder. I'm going to be so undone by the fact that God doesn't let those things happen apart from his sovereign decree and he's using it for my good and he's conforming me to the image of his son. And I'm confident in that. So I want to show you this progression. God's delivery vehicle, we're going to have to talk about the fish. We have the start in this passage, really, of a line from an Eminem song, he's been chewed out and spit up. <laughs> and if he were booed off stage, we would be going. Mama's spaghetti, it's there. It's, <laughs> it's close. Sorry, I went to public school, so that's the first thing that goes into my mind as I see this. Don't worry, I got some, some more... Christian stuff in mind, but nonetheless, that's, that's what came up. So, so let's track this trajectory, God's deliverance into God's answer to prayer, into God's mobilizing us to be merciful, okay? So God's deliverance, God's answer to prayer, take it in the way the text gives it to us. Let's talk about God's delivery vehicle, right? Let's talk about that fish. Bloop, bloop. God's delivery vehicle magnifies his deliverance, okay? God's delivery vehicle magnifies his deliverance. Look at verse 17. He says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Some of you are like, oh, finally, the fish. It all makes sense now. We're getting to the part that I remember the whole, it's about a fish. And really, if you look at it, it's, it's like a fish sandwich. You've got the fish appointed to swallow, and then at the end of the passage, the fish vomits Jonah out. So you've got two fish and then, and then the prayer in the middle. Do you see that? It's like, not fans of fish sandwiches? Okay, but, but it's there. That's this, the way this unfolds. And it's interesting that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That's very telling for us because we tend to get into the fish in the ancient Near Eastern context, the time that it would take to journey to the underworld where you're like really dead was three days and three nights. Which is underscoring the reality, the lengths, the depths to which God goes to rescue us from the depths of death. This is like saying Jonah was really down deep dead. And this is where God goes to bring him out. And so we get to these texts and we're like, man, the fish, the fish is so cool. You remember that poem from William Cooper? He has this awesome line that was probably overlooked last week when I said it to you, and, 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 but it was this. It was deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. Somebody memorized it this week and came and shared it with me. It was awesome. We just made eye contact. So great. <laughs> He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Think about the unfathomable minds where God is spinning all this stuff together and he goes, I'm going to show you one of my awesome ones today. Check this fish out. And yet I think there's something in the way we've taken in this story where we're like making the fish, like we're preoccupied with the fish. But I'm telling you this, if we focus too much on the fish, we're going to miss the greater glory. I've heard the way this gets um, spoken of. Um, you guys go right into apologetics mode. Like, like um, uh, it's a sperm whale because the gullet is big enough for a human to swim in there. So see, this could happen. Oh, oh, it's, it, no, it's a, it's a great white, okay? 
friend at college, it's a great white because listen, the metabolism of a shark is slower than all the whales. They've got four stomachs. And so that would be hard to explain how Jonah could be in the belly for three days, but with the shark, okay, I can explain to you how this could happen. He could be in there for three days, right? You feel this need to defend it or you, or you go into like, or did you know that in June of 2021 off the coast of Cape Cod, there was a lobster diver that got swallowed up by a humpback, huh? Huh? Did you know? And you're like using this as a way to like defend God about the Bible, but listen, you're missing the point if that's what you're doing. If you try to normalize and explain how this can happen purely naturally, you're missing what God is trying to do. He's not trying to make it seem normal. This loved ones was a sovereign swallowing This was a miraculous sign. God doesn't need you to explain him to others about how it could happen from the natural process. God wasn't doing it naturally. He did it supernaturally. He wants you to see that. He wants you to understand that what's happening here is deeper than the fish. It's not about the fish. You know what it's about? It's about a supernatural foreshadowing of the depths to which God will go to save sinners. Jesus mentions this sign multiple times in the Gospels. Let me read you again one of the ones we have been speaking of often for just as Jonah. This is Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. He also speaks of it in reference in chapter 16, verse 4. There's multiple places, but he says this. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Don't get me wrong, God's delivery vehicle is sweet, but his deliverance is greater. There is such a display of the stunning length to which God will go, by the way, to rescue pagan sailors, not just Jonah, He rescued the pagan sailors already, and now he's rescuing a prodigal prophet. This is pointing us to the depths to which God will go. This rescue rescue here is ultimately effective because Jesus Christ would descend into death himself to rescue those imprisoned and dead in their sin, which is every single human being on the planet. On on the third day, he would triumph over death in the resurrection so that anyone who by the free gift of God's grace, by faith, would receive Jesus Christ can be assured death is going to spit you out. It will have no hold over you. And so we go, the fish, the fish, the fish, and I think the whole point of this is if you think the fish is cool swallowing Jonah, you ought to see this cross take up the Son of God and put him in the grave, and he's going to triumph over it. But the difference between Jonah and Jesus is that Jonah deserved in that moment to die for his sin, and God did something miraculous Jesus did not deserve to die for sin. You deserve to die for sin, and he died for you. He was willing to go into the depths of the earth for you. You think the fish is cool. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus. Look where he died. Look how he died. Look how he rose. For God who did not spare his only son, how will he not graciously give you all things? God's got cool tricks up his sleeve. The fish ain't the best one. The salvation it points to is better. You can be forgiven of sin through Jesus. Let me put it another way. You cannot be forgiven of sin outside of Jesus. Let me put it another way. You are going to die and give an account for your life, every last word, thought, deed, and motive, and there is no way to be set right with God apart from trusting in Jesus Christ's work alone, that you have to, in order to be made right with God, be seen as God sees you in Jesus because of your trust in Jesus, that you become united to him by faith alone. You don't earn it, you must receive it, and when you become united to Jesus Christ, God looks at you as if you live Jesus' life. 
the only life that is acceptable to the Father. And when he looks at Jesus, who died on the cross, he looks at Jesus as if he lived your life. And so you can be set free completely from all your sin, past, present, and future, only by Jesus Christ alone. The point isn't look at the fish. The point is God saves sinners, and the Savior is Jesus. So delivery vehicle is cool. He got swallowed by the fish. The deliverance is greater. Now let's go to the prayer. God's answer, number two, magnifies his sovereign mercy. You're going to find this prayer to be actually kind of interesting. You're going to find that Jonah was conscious in the fish long enough to pray this prayer. Okay? Because otherwise you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, I don't understand why he's talking in the past tense. I'm not sure what's really going on here. Uh, he's able to get out three stanzas of a prayer before, how long does it take to pray three stanzas of a prayer? He was in there for three days. It's a long time. We don't know what he was doing the rest of the time. We know he had enough time, at least conscious, to pray this prayer. And so we're gonna look at it. It is his prayer of thanksgiving. It is three stanzas, it's two to four, Verses 5 to 7 and verses 8 to 9. Notice how it starts. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Past tense. I called, he answered, I cried, you heard my voice. When he's referring to his distress, he's referring to the time he was swimming in the water. I was drowning in the sea you came. If we understand this to be, I'm freaking out because I'm in the whale, that's, not the, that's the salvation vehicle the whale is. When he's saying, out of my distress, I called out to you, he is desperately pleading to the Lord with some of his last breaths. I mean, you know, what's that thing water polo guys do where they can like come out of the water up to their hips? You know what I'm talking about? Egg beater. Any of you egg beat? Is that, like a, is that how you, what you call it? Anyone do that, like do that super well? Like I've heard you have certain amounts of time. Nobody wants to admit that. You, you do, Alexa? Maybe a long time ago. Okay, okay, right? So if you get thrown out there in the middle, and that's like a pool, right? That's not like an ocean, but you're, you're like, if you're world class, you get what? Can you do that for like an hour? Can like the best of the best? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. But like 50 hours, that's going to be a struggle. So it, let's just assume Jonah's not like, a, a, like an all Olympic water polo player. And just go with this desperate prayer is coming amongst minutes, hours. And he's pleading with the Lord about his distress in the water, and you have to remember, going back, this is deserved distress, is it not? Some distress we fall into, not deserved, but God has allowed it into our lives. Others, deserved. This one, can we agree? Deserved. This is self-inflicted distress, and in fact, when you come to Christ, your salvation story, your testimony, it starts here. I was distressed by sin, but I recognized that I deserved that distress because the sin was on me. To come to an end of yourself and become a Christian, it, it starts with acknowledging your sin, but then it, starts by, and then it continues by being distressed by sin, and then its consequences begin to strip you of every other reliable hope to make you feel like, you know, oh, I'm good. Everything's okay. I'm still a good person. Whatever those justifying measures are, Jonah was losing those in the water. And you know what else Jonah was losing probably in the water? By the time he had got there, he was probably losing every logical ex expectation that God should answer his prayer. Right? Like, you know, like, think about it. When you know you've totally botched it and you pray to the Lord, do you pray a little sheepishly? Come on. Because you're like, I kind of deserve to be where I am right? And, in, and if God was more like you, he'd leave you exactly where you are. 
But see, the thing is, God's not like you. In fact, one of the things I'm noticing so much in life as I go is God is stunningly not like us. And our tendency is when we, it's, we're, we have distress and we deserve it because of what we've done, we're not going to pray about it. But yet what I find so interesting is if you're pressed enough, maybe you will. And here's the stunning reality. You'll find God answers the prayer. God answers the plea for mercy. God is delighted despite your self-inflicted circumstances to respond with an undeserving favor. We don't have a category for that until God builds it for us. We think we deserve these things. We do it some sense. For sure. But God is merciful to the one who pleads for mercy. And so if you're in this place and you're in this like, man, I have every reasonable expectation to believe that God shouldn't answer this prayer, pray anyway. Because God answers that prayer. He loves to answer that prayer. And it's not just any prayer. If you notice, it is a prayer of repentance. When you think about what it looks like to repent, that's a turning away from your sin back towards God, okay? When, when repentance happens in your life, which is the process of turning to faith in Jesus, right? You gotta go walk back down the, 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 the pathway that you left to get where you were going. What were the two things that we said at the beginning he walked away from? He departed from God's word and he defied what? God's presence. Let's see if his repentance matches. Ready? Think about this language for a second. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Does that sound familiar? Like maybe another Bible verse? Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the hearts of the sea, and the floods surround me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. That is a almost direct quote of Psalm 42, verse 7, at the end of verse 3. Here is a guy who had departed from God's word that now sounds like a psalmist in his prayer. I mean, this dude was coming all the way back. Some actually that study this say that this had to have been written years and years later because it has such a rich composition of multiple psalms woven throughout his prayer. But here's what they're failing to acknowledge about what's going on here. This is the word of God once planted deep in the heart, now coming out in the moment of desperation and coming to your lips again. This is the power of the memorization of the Bible. This is the fruit of the worship services he sat in on, of the training he was a part of, of the studying of the word of God so that it was in him, okay? Men, like the six pack you have, right? Come on. It's down there, isn't it? It's got some wayward fat over the top, but it's down there, okay? And if you needed to access it, I'm sure we could push each other hard enough to get it back, all right? But it's there. This is the, this is the reality of memorization of the word of God. For the parents in the room, and I, I've heard from so many of you in this series, man, this has been helpful, this is so encouraging. Let me just say, one of the things that you can trust in at the end of the day, you're like, man, I, I disciple my kids, I talk to them about Jesus, we, we memorize scripture together, I'm telling you right now, this is an indicator in this passage that as you're awaiting the return of your prodigal son or daughter, you can trust the Lord with the implanted word in your kids' hearts you will be surprised in the moments when they are pressed to utter desperation in God's sovereignty, what will come out in that moment as they're pleading to, with the Lord to provide mercy in a repentant prayer. It'll just start popping up. It's why we believe by conviction now what Psalm 119 says, that I stored up the word deep in my heart that I might not sin against you. It has in itself a, this echo of, of Proverbs 22, right? 
train up your child in the way he should go, and in the end you won't depart from it. That's not like a guarantee. You're like, I did it. Where's the exchange? But it is to say that generally speaking, that is true. And I've heard the stories of like Awanas rescuing a kid in their darkest moment. Like of the Bible coming to bear on someone's heart. It was coming to bear on Jonah's heart in the last hour. But it's not just that. I said he needed to return to the Lord, and that would mean re-returning, returning to the word of God. And it would also be coming back to the presence of God, which, by the way, him coming back to prayer in God is in itself a return to the presence of God, Correct? But it's more than that. I, I want you to see this. Look, look at me with, at, at John 1.15, or excuse me, Jonah 1.15. We had to go back here for a second to understand the significance of verse 3. Jo- Jonah 1.15 says, so they, so they, who's they? The sailors, they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea. Correct? Okay, go back to, to, to Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. For you cast me into the sea. The sailors tossed Jonah, but here is Jonah in chapter 2, verse 3, saying that God was ultimately quarterbacking that toss. What happens when you return to the Lord is not only do you return to the Lord in his presence, but you return to an interpretation of your life that has the Lord in the midst of everything. In fact, you can begin to see that health when you start to see your life in that way. When you are close to the presence of God, you see his hands. You understand and recognize that there isn't a way in the world that a sailor hurls him anywhere apart from God decreeing that it be so. There isn't a single thing that can come to you in your life, no matter how evil, no matter how wicked, no matter how much that seems to have its own individual power and and property over your life, it doesn't come to you unless it's decreed by God that it be so. And when you are close to God, you start to again recognize and see his hand in this is everywhere. You cast me into the sea into the hearts, the flood surrounds me, your waves and your billows, that is exactly what he experienced. And we continue to move forward and he starts to explain his deserving of this and how his sin separates him from God, which is one of the first recognitions, right, of a believer that my sin separates me from God. Verse four, then I said, I am driven away from your sight Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. I have been banished, he says, from your sight. Acknowledging it, believing it, deserving it. I deserve to be separated from you. But this interesting reality, hope dawns here for Jonah. He says that I have hope that I will yet again Look upon your holy temple. But what we will find about that hope as we continue to go is that hope would not rest in him. In fact, here is the process by which we go through as people, as we truly come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. It starts with a clear acknowledgement that I deserve what has come upon me and that separation from God because of my sin. And here's the next most important part. Many stay in the I deserve thing and just wallow into self-pity. But here's the next thing you have to recognize. I can't fix it myself. The ones who wallow in the self-pity are the ones who try and try and try and try to find a way to assuage the guilt, to push it off, to make it feel better, to walk more old ladies across the street and take the proverbial scales you think God weighs his people by and fill that side up with a bunch of good works. And when mercy dawns in the life of a person, two things are often clear. I deserve it because of my sin when it's sin-related, and I can't fix it in my own strength. Look at the way Jonah talks about this. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Could you imagine your egg beating like in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea? 
and this like huge thing of seaweed like wraps your head up. Like you have to go, you'd have to think about like the idea of trying to pull it off your face. And we're talking like, you know, if you've ever had a wet towel like pressed against your face, it's like hard to breathe, right? Like you're like, come on, I'm already swimming. I'm trying to survive. Now I have these weeds there. It's choking me to death. These weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. He's talking about this idea of the, uh, the netherworld, the, the underworld, death, right? That this, he's, call, he's describing it as like a watery prison that's soon to become his watery grave. Like this is the end for him, period. This is a prison you're not getting out of. This isn't the rock where you sneak out of Alcatraz, right? This isn't prison break. This is legit prison not getting out. You have to come to the end of yourself. If you don't actually come to an end of yourself with the Lord at some point in your life, I deserve this and I can't fix it. Truly, actually, maybe with death on the line is what we'll take. Some of us are that stubborn, amen? I feel like I, I could be that stubborn. I feel like each one of us has that in us because of our sinfulness, because what makes the next word, what makes the next pivot so powerful is when you understand I deserve it and I cannot fix it no matter what I do. I am stuck. Because then it breaks forth into but God. Yet... Our but God here is yet, yet you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God, from the lowest depths, the rockiest of bottoms, the Alcatraz of the netherworld on steroids, God brought him up. That's the testimony of our Christian lives. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, and you are doing, you are, you are a sinner by choice as much as you are a sinner by nature. You spent so much time, time trying to walk around and just make yourself feel okay, justify yourself in the process, but God in his mercy was pursuing you for some significant trials to get your attention that the peace that you feel is actually a peace because you've seared your spiritual senses. And he shocks you out of that faux peace that you have and you come in that moment in the midst of the storm or the swimming or whatever to realize I can't do anything to fix it. I need mercy in a miracle form. But God, rich, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, gave us Jesus, sent him. Paul, I think of Paul's words when he says in 2 Corinthians 1, 9, this is, a, this is a common theme. What I'm talking about here is this idea of in Paul's ministry, it, it, he said, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He goes back in verse 7 and speaks of the moment where he finally started praying. Isn't it interesting? And this is what I'm saying. This is in us. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. I finally did it. Some of us were like, no, 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 no. God's like, I am going to put your head underwater. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And here's what's so stunning. My prayer came to you. God received it, God heard it, and God answered it. And listen to this, he says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. He goes, when I was growing faint of consciousness, this is the idea, when I was on the brink of passing out in the water at the 11th hour, God, you answered and here's what he's trying to explain to us. If you go to the grave without calling out to God for mercy, you will forfeit the grace that could be yours. Because to not call out to God for mercy as you go down to the grave is to cling to the idols that your heart is steadfastly set on instead of the living God. 
This is one of the most powerful verses in the whole section. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Is this not what's going on right now? That those who worship idols will discover in times of trouble how impotent they are? It's what we're discovering right now in troubling times, isn't it? There's an unbelievable level of anxiety out there. There's an unbelievable level of anxiety that's dwelling in your heart right now, Christian. There's an unbelievable level of fear that you are living in on a day-to-day -day basis. If it's not the mass, it's the vaccines. If it's not the vaccines, it's the smoke. We're all just going to die here breathing California smoke. It's whatever's next, it's whatever problem, it, you're, you're freaked into believing that the world is completely spiraling out of control when it's the exact opposite. Everything is absolutely falling right into place in accordance with God's sovereign will. And, and I just wonder if the level of anxiety and the level of fear that you're walking in and the level of lack of hope that you have is actually indicative of, of idolatry in your heart. Here's what happens in our context. We can pick up idols like subconsciously almost where you can't even see it and it takes a storm to surface the idols that would otherwise lay dormant in your life. And so God brings up a little storm and you freak out and we find out what you are trusting in. Oh, it turns out job security, as nice as that is, has slipped into being something you trust in for peace in your life. That this starts to heat up and you start to freak out and realize, whoa, 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 I, I realize I trusted so much in physical health for my peace, for my sense of well-being, for my sense of identity. Something spins up and, and another storm and, 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 and maybe Newsom doesn't get recalled and, and, uh, and I'm out of here. Christians are leaving left and right from California. The irony is, if they're mission-minded at some point, they're going to have to come back. <laughs> I've said it before. And I will say it again. If you're mission-minded, it's not that every person that moves to a safe place in the South isn't a mission-minded decision. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying, eventually... If there's really a missions field out there, then you'll be coming back to the, deep, the big, deep holes. I don't want to cuss right now. The big, deep <laughs> holes. By accident, of course, guys. Um, of spiritual darkness that is right here. So we're panicking and going, oh my gosh, U-Haul is sold out. <laughs> Instead of going, God's ripening the field right in front of us. And for nothing else, to hear the gospel glorifies God. They reject it, it's to their judgment, but they heard it from you. And God gets glory in judgment as much as he gets glory in salvation, so what are we scared about? Something about the storms that surface the idols in our hearts. But they're so settling when, when you come through the storm and you confess your idols and you believe that God really is ultimately in control. You come to this place in verse 9 where he says, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will pay. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is the central point of the Bible. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is the reason for thanksgiving for his being good on his vows, salvation is God's. What he's doing here, though, is it's being expressed substantively. He had theology down before, now he has it theology down, down, down. Okay? Here's, how I, here's what I mean, if you're not tracking with me. Here's how we would say it in our context. Ready? I know this is cliche, but I just have to say salvation belongs to the Lord. You, you ever said something like that in small group? Like God's working you through something. I've heard it so many times. I, I know this sounds cliche, but, and you're learning this like really awesome, profound truth about God, but you're like almost, it's almost so simple. It's like salvation belongs to the Lord. Got a few nods and everyone else is just staring. Um, okay, I've heard it from you. 
So, so, so he, is, he is deeply receiving the theology through this storm, through this rock bottom reality that is, it unleashes something in his life and it's the power of experienced truth. Storms lead us to experience truth. We stop talking about salvation belongs to the Lord as a concept, and we start really figuring out, does that rubber, is that rubber meeting the road in our lives? Do we really believe salvation belongs to the Lord? It's not partially yours, it's all his, all of it. Do we believe that? Do we believe he comes and he saves? Do we believe rock of ages, not the labors of my hands, can fulfill thy law's demands? Could my zeal no respite? No, I know we sing that song. Like, I have no idea what that means. It means, hey, if my zeal never stopped, or I never stopped crying for all my sorriness, I'm really sorry, God. He says this, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. And then it pivots here. God's salvation mobilizes us to go. And here's where he finishes. He comes to the end of his prayer. And we just get these simple words. He's ready to return. He's ready to receive the Lord's word and go. And he says this, and the Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. We have no indication from the text that he landed the dismount. <laughs> right? There's no red carpet rolled out for him in the process, and he didn't come out smelling great. But he had some things going for him this time that were different than before. And listen to me. They're recurring lessons, Christian. This isn't just for your unbelieving friend. I've got to send this to him. No, no, no. Uh, uh, they're recurring lessons. What are the lessons? He had a sense of his own sinfulness renewed. He had a sense of what it's like to be far from God. And he had renewed the exhilaration that grace brings when it takes someone from death and brings them to life. It doesn't take much to be a missionary for Jesus. You have to be marveling at his mercy. John Newton, at the end of his life, he was fading in memories, and he couldn't remember many things, but he said this. He said, I don't remember many things, but I remember two, and they motivate my life. He says, I know this, that I am a great sinner. And Jesus Christ is a great savior. So we're gonna come to the table because the table is where we're reminded again of the mercy of God. You think the fish is cool? Come be reminded of the cross. Come be reminded of the body of Jesus broken. Come be reminded of the blood of Jesus that was spilt for your sin. Come be reminded that your assurance of pardon is found in the forgiving final work of Jesus Christ. Come to the table remembering that the only storm that can really destroy that storm of divine justice and judgment for sin has been assuaged by the Savior for you. And come marveling at the fact that because Jesus Christ was hurled headfirst into the storm, absorbing the just wrath of God, deserving your sin and mine, that now you and I can be sure that every storm we face as Christians are storms that are big with mercy and will break in blessing on your head. Ben is going to lead us in worship today, so, uh, or excuse me, in communion today. Worship's a given. And, um, and so come and take, and if you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would say come to Jesus. Don't come to the table yet. We come as celebrators of the work of Jesus Christ. If that's not you, perhaps leaning over to a friend that brought you to talk about Jesus, that's your first step. Believers, when you're ready, come, let's take communion together, and let's sing celebration of the Lord's grace.